All glories to assemble devotees. All glories to assemble devotees. All glories to assemble devotees. All glories to Sri Sri Guru, Sri Guru, and all glories to Sri Prabhupada. So, Hare Krishna, everybody. Hare Krishna, everybody. How is everybody doing? So we're happy to have you all here. Today we'll be reading from Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 4, text number 22, chapter number 22, and text number 17. Um, nice text. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. 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 Narayanam Namaskrita. Naram Chaiva Narotamam Devim Saraswatim Vyasam Tojaya Badirai Nasta Prashu Badreshu Nityam Bhagavata Sevaya Bhagavate Uttama Shloke Bhaktir Bhavati Naishtiki before reciting the Srimad Bhagavatam, which is our very means of conquest, one should offer his respectful obeisances to the personality of Godhead, Narayan, and to Nara, Narayan Rishi, the supermost human being, and to Mother Saraswati, the goddess of learning, and to Srila Vyasadeva, the author. A regular attendance on classes in the Srimad Bhagavatam and by rendering service to the pure devotee, all that is troublesome in the heart is practically eradicated, and loving service to the personality of Godhead who is praised with transcendental songs is established in the heart as an irrevocable fact. So, yeah, we'd like to welcome Raul. Welcome. I actually thought it was Thursday today, so I was thinking everything was way off. And I was thinking Dara was getting classes and we realized it was Wednesday. Wednesday's kind of an open day. So either me or Ethan are going to give. So I decided to give. So we're going to read the verse. And then we'll repeat, and then we'll read the synonyms, and then we'll read the translation. Maitreya Vacha, Maitreya Vacha, Pritos Tatsukta Markanya, Pritos Tatsukta Markanya. Sorry, Pritos Tatsukta Akanya, 
Saram shushtu mitam maru Saram shushtu mitam maru Smaya mana iva apritya Komara pratyuyu vacha Pritos tat sukta markanya Saram sushtu mitam maru Smaya mana iva pritya Komara pratyuvacha Pritos tat suktam akanya Saram shushtu mitam maru Smaya mana iva pritya Komara pratyuvacha Word for word Maitreya Vacha, the great sage Maitreya continued to speak. Pritaho of King Pritu, that, that, suktam, Vedic conclusion, akarnya, hearing, saram, very substantial, shushtu, appropriate. Mitam, minimized. Maru, sweet to hear. Smaya mana, smiling. Eva, like. Pritya, out of great satisfaction. Komaraha, celibate. Pratyuvacha, applied. Ha, thus. But my mind is frazzled out. Okay, we can go back and go ahead and read the verse. So we'll just do the translation. Translation The great sage Maitreya continued. The great sage Maitreya continued. Thus. Sanat Kumara, the best of the celibates, after hearing the speech of Prithu Maharaj, was meaningfully meaningful, which was meaningful, appropriate, full of precise words and very sweet to hear, smiled with full satisfaction and began to speak as follows. Please repeat. The great sage Maitreya continued. The great sage Maitreya continued. Thus Sanat Kumara. Thus the best of the celibates. The best of the celibates. After hearing the speech of Prithu Maharaj, which was meaningful, appropriate, full of precise words, and very sweet to hear, smiled with satisfaction, and began to speak as follows. Purport. Maharaj Prithu talks before the Kumaras were very laudable because of so many qualifications. A speech should be composed of selected words, very sweet to hear and appropriate to the situation. Such speech is called meaningful. All these good qualifications are present in Prithu Maharaj's speech because he is a perfect devotee. It is said, Yasyasti Bhaktir Bhagavat Yang Kinchana Savir Gunais Tatra Samshate Suraha. One who has unflinching devotional faith in the Supreme Personality of Godhead as engaged in his service, all good qualities become manifest in his person. Thus, the Kumaras were very much pleased, and Sanat Kumar began to speak as follows. Om Ajnana Tamarandyasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chakshur Militam Jaina Tasmai Sri Gurve Nama Sri Shaitanya Manobhistam Stapitam Yenabhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadati Swapadantikam Vandeyam Shri Guru Shri Taparakamalam Shri Guru and Vaishnavam Sha Shri Rupam Sagajatam Sagana Raganatan Vitam Tam Sajivam Sadvetam Savadutam Parijana Saitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padan Sagana Lalita Shri Vishakan Vitam Sha 
He Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jagat Pate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostate Tapta Kanchan Gorangi Radha Vrindavan Ishvari Vishimana Shuti Devi Pranamami Ari Priye Vancha Kalpatur Mishcha Kripa Sindhu Bhyevacha Padita Nam Bhavane Bhyo Vaishnavavya Namo Nama Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadara Shri Vasari Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Namo Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prashtaya Bhutale Shamati Bhaktivedanta Swami Tinamani. Namaste Saraswati Devi Gaur Bhakti Pachari. Namaste Saraswati Devi Gaur Bhakti So, Sometimes when I'm saying the mantra, when I'm saying the, the Monday hum prayers, I I want to, because you, you say those prayers when you do the shilas, say the shilas, and so I always want to start doing the shila mantras. You know, you get trained to these things. It's a sign that you're actually kind of unconscious when you're doing it. So, also nice to, nice to see you, John. Thanks for coming. In a while. Yes. So, uh, so this is a nice, beautiful point here. So, what's going on in in, in uh, review? We have Maharaj Prithu, a great king, a great saintly king, a great king who was a devotee of the Lord, and he has a very interesting history. But we're not going to go back that far. He's having a meeting with these four Kumaras. The four Kumaras are great saints, great sages, and they appear as though they're five-year-old children, although they're actually the oldest beings in the universe. They're the original sons of Lord Brahma. So Lord Brahma had many, many, many children just from his mind when he was creating the universe. And the very first of the, of the children of Lord Brahma were these four Kumaras. So they're the oldest beings in the universe, aside from Lord Brahma himself. They're older than Narada, they're older than Lord Shiva, even though Lord Shiva is actually eternal, unlike Brahma, and, but he, he appears to come after the Kumaras. So the Kumaras are these great sages, and then when Lord Brahma created them, he said, please uh, go and reproduce, bring progeny. And then they said, no, we want to just be brahmacharis. We want to be celibates and give our life to God. And so we're going to remain as children. And in that way, they just stayed their entire lives as children, although they're not like humans, they're eternal beings. Um, and the most elevated, spiritually wise entities, and you can imagine one of the four um, Sampradaya heads, so the four lines of teachers start with the Kumaras, Brahma, Shiva, and uh, Lakshmi Devi. And also one of the 12 Mahajans, or 12 great spiritual authorities in the universe, the Kumaras are considered one. So now this conversation is taking place between Prithu Maharaj and the Kumaras. And the conversation is being described by another great sage named Maitreya Muni. So we're seeing the great sage Maitreya continued. Thus after Sanat and Kumara, the best of the celibates, after hearing the street speech of Prithu Maharaj, which was meaningful, appropriate, full of precise words and very sweet to hear, smiled with full satisfaction and began to speak. So, um, Prithi Maharaj was glorifying the Kumaras, which is the custom of, of a civilized individual, is that when a person who is spiritually advanced appears, one should glorify them with sweet words. One should treat them appropriately. And that's part of spiritual advancement is understanding how to treat individuals on a, on a personal basis based on their position. And that's be called being expert. It's one of the, the qualities of a devotee that we learn to become expert in our dealings with others. And that's what separates a devotee of the Lord from just a normal yogi or a normal jnani or karmi. A devotee of the Lord um, knows how to treat people. He knows how to deal with people in a way that they're always pleased because he sees that Krishna is in the heart of every living entity. And so he has to learn to deal with them in such a way that he's pleasing Krishna in their heart. So the Nectar of Instruction or the Upadesha Amrita, which is a book written by our great sage 
uh, Rupa Goswami and is considered one of the most quintessential texts for Gaudiya Vaishnavas, says that you treat a highly elevated devotee who is pure and advanced Krishna consciousness and completely free from the propensity to criticize. You treat such a devotee with great care and service. And you're going to care and, and serve that devotee. Like we serve Srila Prabhupada, we serve our gurus. Those are devotees who are on a very high level. And then for a devotee who is a Madhya Madhikari or middle devotee, you become friends with them. You have a friend, friendly relationship with them and you offer them visible obeisances. So such a devotee who is engaged in worshiping the deity has taken initiation. He's a serious spiritual practitioner who is advancing in spiritual life. Such a person, you offer them visible obeisances. So when you see a devotee, you should always... Um, offer them obeisances or offer them visible pranams because they're spiritually advanced souls. They're actually taking to the process of spiritual life, which Krishna explains in the Bhagavad Gita. He says, out of millions and millions among men, hardly any are even interested in spiritual life. And out of those who are interested in spiritual life, hardly any achieve any type of perfection. So to see that someone is serious about spiritual life means they're one in a million. I want to speak of someone who attains perfection. Out of millions of those who attain perfection, hardly any of those can understand me, the personality of Godhead. So devotees are very special. Krishna himself is confirming that those who are in knowledge of Krishna, of the personality of Godhead, and are devotees of Krishna, not just spiritualists, not just controlling their senses, not just yogis or jnanis or ascetics, but those who are in knowledge of the personality of Godhead, that is extremely rare and extremely powerful. So we should offer them visible obeisances, visible respect. And then for those who are just simply chanting the holy name, if someone's chanting the holy name, they are coming to the temple, they're engaging in the kirtan, then they're also a devotee. And Krishna, uh, Rupa Goswami explains that they should be given mental respect and treated with kindness. You should offer them mental respects. So there's something called sadhu sindha, means it's offenses to the sadhus, offenses to the saintly persons. And so not greeting, not feeling joyful upon seeing a saintly person is actually an offense. That's why I always feel so joyful when I look at Ajitesh Prabhu. When I see Ajitesh Prabhu, I always get super joyful because he's such a saintly person. That's why I call him, I don't even call him Prabhu, I call him sadhu. He's a saintly sadhu. So you should always feel happy when you see a person engaged in God's service factually. Even if that person, you know, we say, oh, we're devotees. You see someone that's a priest, some other person from a different religion, but they're engaged in God's service. We should show them visible respect. I know I saw a priest once at the Walmart. He looked really frazzled. I, I did this. And he said, God bless you. He got, me, got in his car. But we should show them respect. So that's part of being expert in, in, in advancing in spiritual life. And that's a symptom of someone who's advanced in spiritual life. It's one thing to meditate all day. It's one thing to go into the cave and it's one thing to even control your senses when you're alone. But the real test is how do you deal with others? How tolerant and humble are you? How do you test tolerance and humility by being with others? So even the greatest yogi in the cave, you know, he may come down for a few days to the, is Khan Tucson and freak out because he's not ready to handle being with other people, which is actually more pleasing to Krishna than just going into the cave and meditating. It's more pleasing. It's more powerful because actually we're meant to love each other. Sankirtan means together and chanting and loving each other together and, and helping each other on the path. So that's a higher level of pleasing Krishna. And there's a very famous verse when the Lord appears to the Prachetas and he says, I'm very happy because of your loving feelings toward each other. This pleases me very much. So that love and camaraderie and, and spirit of working together that the devotees develop amongst themselves is the most pleasing thing we can do for Krishna. And that means we have to let go of our own false egos and accept the will of Krishna, accept 
that we're his servants and, and work together on the same page in, in performing that devotional service. So, um, because Prithu Maharaj is a great Mahabhagavat devotee of the Lord, he's one of the greatest devotees of the Lord, he is very expert in speaking these words, which we've been hearing for the last few weeks, of praise to these great saints, the Kumaras. And the Kumaras, hearing such words, are pleased. What does it mean if you please a saintly person? Yeah, but you also get blessings. So if you see, it's one thing to serve God, to have a deity, but actually it's more powerful to serve the devotees of the Lord. That's more pleasing to the Lord. And that's a universal principle. It's not just in the Bhagavatam. Even the Bible explains that. You know, the, the Greek, there's the famous Bible verse, you know, no one comes to the Father if not through me. I'm the way, the truth, and the light. Well, actually, the, no one comes to the Father if not through me in Greek is no one comes to the Father if not through one of the Father. So one of the Father means a pure devotee of the Lord, someone who's fully surrendered. So you have to approach the Lord through his devotees. And the way you deal with devotees, the way you speak to them, the way you desire to serve them, the way you avoid offenses, the way you elevate them or, or you... You, you don't criticize them is very pleasing to Krishna. That's actually the most quintessential part of bhakti. You can see that, you know, you see someone, maybe they don't have the best sadhana. Maybe they're not like, you know, right on with the shlokas and memorizing verses. But if they're pleasing to the devotees and they're not offensive, they just shoot upward way fast. I go back to Ethan. He's a, in a different dimension right now, Krishna Prema, but... He's so pleasing to the he's so pleasing to the devote he's so pleasing to the devotees that he doesn't make a difference. So he's got perfect behavior. So I was just saying that you have such nice you're so nice to the devotees that no matter what, no matter how many times you fall asleep in Bhagavatam class, <laughs> you're, you're always you're always you're, you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna go back home back to Godhead because you're so you're so so such a nice wonderful person. Yes. So, so um, anyhow, that leads us to the main point: is how do we how do we learn to speak to others? How do we act in such a way that we're perfect gentlemen, we're devotees, and we learn how to be pleasing to the devotees? Um, Krishna explains in the Bhagavad Gita; he, he gives this uh, threefold austerity, very beautiful part of the Bhagavad Gita. Um, There's austerities that we have to perform. Austerity means giving up something voluntarily for achieving a higher purpose. So someone may give up so many things to achieve a higher purpose. But an, an example is that for someone who wants to be an athlete, they're giving up so much time and they're putting their body through so much strain so that they can achieve a certain level of performance. And in that way, you know, win the competition. So austerity is there, but for what are what are we performing austerity, and what is the proper austerity to perform to advance in spiritual life and to have an experience of God on a constant basis? So Krishna he gives these um, directions in the Bhagavad Gita that are explaining what is austerity, what is happiness, what is um, sacrifice in such a way that the person performing it is doing it in the mode of goodness. One second here. So the austerities of the of speech are to speak words that are truthful, pleasing, beneficial not agitating to others, and regular quoting Vedic scriptures. So this is what's considered austerity of speech. So there's a very famous verse in the Upadesha Amrita, uh, the Nectar of Instruction, which is 11 concise instructions on spiritual life. And these 11 instructions are considered the most important quintessential aspects of spiritual life. And if one follows them and lives them, then they are going to advance very rapidly. 
And so the very first instruction says, Vacha Vegam, Manasakroda Vegam, Jiva Vegam, Buddha Parasta Vegam, Etan Vegam, Yavishleta Dira, Sarvam Apima, Priti Vim Sashishyat. And so the first thing is Vacha Vegam, control the urge to speak. So this urge to speak is like just like anything in the material world. It's actually just an urge. It's not spiritual in its in its in its essence spiritual speech is something different but we we just want to say something totally just because i i have to say it i want to share my own internal aspect of my ego that is actually detrimental to our spiritual life so a spiritual person learns how to speak in such a way that the words are truthful beneficial pleasing to others they're not useless it's not useless speech so that urge to speak is like we have an urge to eat, right? We have to control ourselves. We don't want to eat too much. We don't want to eat too little. We have these bodily urges, vacho vega, manasakrota vega, the urges of the mind, the urges of anger. Sometimes we get very angry, but rather we then act on that anger, we control ourselves. Jifa vega, the urge of the, of the mouth, of the tongue, the taste. Uta Parasta Vegam, the urge of the belly and the genitals. Those are urges. And so the first of those urges is this urge to just blabber. But actually, that is not conducive to spiritual advancement in the slightest. Because it takes our mind away from Krishna and it destroys our sense of gravity. So a devotee means grave. Although we devotees that can be lighthearted and joke and be happy, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're always blabbering they're very serious because it's a serious thing life is actually in one sense lighthearted, but in the other sense it's serious because we have to understand where we're at <clears throat> if you're in the middle of a battlefield there's bullets flying by there's bombs exploding would you be joking around laughing just lolly lolly la all the time no we wouldn't because we're because you're in the middle of a battlefield but because of the elusive material energy we can't perceive that we're actually in the middle of a battlefield because as a spirit soul from our essential identity when we stop identifying with this body we realize i'm actually a soul i'm an eternal living being and somehow or another by the arrangement of karma and illusion i've got myself in a pretty precarious situation i am in a body I'm experiencing birth, death, old age, and disease. This is unnatural circumstances for the spirit soul. It's not natural for a soul to experience these things. Why do I have to suffer these things as a soul? And why is there so much misery in the world? These are you know, existential questions that people have asked for millions of years. Why is there suffering in the world? Why did God create a world that's apparently unperfect? Well, the answer in the Vedic scriptures is that this world is a place where the living entity comes to be an illusion and to, to forget our relationship with Krishna. And therefore, we just, you know, want to enjoy, we want to do so many things. So we start, you know, being willy nilly about life. And in that way, we live our life trying to fulfill so many material desires, and then we die. We didn't actually accomplish any spiritual work. We're just trying to fulfill our desires. We're just trying to have a good moment. But an intelligent person understands what's actually going on, that we're in a battlefield in one sense, because as a spirit soul, we shouldn't have to die. We shouldn't have to suffer. This is not our actual position. This is the position of a spirit soul who is affected by the elusive material energy. And in the human form of life, we can understand this fact. And therefore, the human form of life is very special because we can understand I'm not this body, I'm the soul within the body. And therefore, we can act in such a way that we can extricate ourselves from material entanglement and achieve enlightenment or real happiness, real peace, real lightheartedness, real joy. We can have that. So it starts off with this urge to, to speak. The words have power. Everybody understands that, right? Words have power. Someone insults you, it can hurt you very badly. Much worse than even, you know, getting hit in the face or 
you know, physical injury. If someone you love speaks some painful words to you, and that really can affect you, the words have immense amount of power. So the more we control that, the more gravity we have with our speech, the more that our words are going to be effective. So when someone who is a saintly person who is quiet, someone like guru, right? Guru means heavy. That means their opinion outdoes everybody else's opinion. So when the guru speaks, everything else is overweighed. So that's because his words have weight because he's meditating on God and he's speaking beneficial words, truthful, pleasing, beneficial, non-agitating. He's thinking in such a way. So we have to think like that. So Krishna is saying, the Bhagavad Gita says, there's threefold austerities. There's austerity of the body, austerity of speech, austerity of the mind. So austerity, like I said, means something we give up to attain a higher benefit or a higher goal. So Krishna says, austerity of the body consists in worship of the Supreme Lord. So we have this human form of body. The very first um, teaching of the Brahma Sutra, Ato Brahma Jigyasa, and now is the time to inquire about the absolute truth. That means now that you've had the human form of life, which is the, the only form of life that can question what is the absolute truth. Now that I've achieved this form, Atho Brahma Jigyasa, let me inquire as to what is the truth. So why live like an animal? The animals are all eating. The animals are sleeping. They're mating. They're making sounds that mean nothing. They have communication. I was just hearing something about how, you know, the dolphins, they have immense amounts of communication. They even have names. And they'll whisper the name. They'll teach their children their name. This is dolphins. It's pretty amazing. It, you know, from the external scientific point of view. But what are the dolphins vibrating about? Oh, look at that fish. You know, that's, that's like, you know, they're, they're, all, their, all, their, all their language is based on eating, sleeping, mating, and defending. And dolphins don't have a god. Right? Also, birds, birds, birds also have name, but the birds, they don't have a God. You can teach a, you know, Prabhupada says you can teach a parrot to say Krishna. And the parrot can chant Krishna, Krishna, Krishna. But then when the, when the cat comes to kill the parrot, what does the parrot say? <coughs> doesn't say Krishna. Because the parrot's not actually meditating on Krishna. So we should not just use this power of speech to, uh, you know, wasted. It's a very powerful thing. Just like we, you know, sexual energy is very powerful. We control our sexual energy because it's very powerful. It can bring a child into the world. So therefore we say, don't waste it. Everything is a very, very powerful energy that we have. And the human form of life can do amazing things. When we say, oh, we put a man on the moon, we build these skyscrapers. These are very minimal in comparison to the actual human destiny of becoming an enlightened being, becoming a Krishna conscious devotee of God, having scientific knowledge of the personality of Godhead beyond the level of belief and sentiment, but actually knowing and speaking with God himself. That's what the human can do. If the human follows the process of bhakti yoga, he can have such an experience of the Lord. That's a fact. It's not a, it's not a religion. It's not a sentiment. It's not a belief. It's a fact. It's a scientific fact that if we follow a certain process, and we use our body and mind in the proper way, we can have revelation of God. Therefore, the power of speech is, is important. So austerity of the body, that means consisting of worship of the Lord. What are we using this body for? We can use this body for so many different things. But to engage the body in the service of the Lord is the real austerity. That what are we doing? We're, what is our austerity? How do we do that? We wake up very, very early. And we come to Mangal Artik, we dance. And we're using this body, this special time, rather than using it to sleep or to enjoy our own sense gratification, we're using it to worship the Lord and therefore making great spiritual advancement in doing so. The Brahmanas, worshiping the Brahmanas. So how do we mean, what does it mean to worship the Brahmanas? It means to serve those spiritually advanced souls. 
rather than serving the demons, which is what most people are doing, right? They're serving demons because they want some, you know, I want some good job. So I'm going to get a, you know, get a job at the, the demon corporation, you know, building weapons of mass destruction, but I get paid, you know, a good amount, that type of thing. That's the consciousness, you know. So I'm, I'm serving those who are selfish, inimical, full of bad qualities. So Krishna is saying, if you want to really work your body, serve the Brahmins, serve those saintly people who are engaged in propagating spiritual knowledge, who are engaged in freeing the conditioned living entities from birth, death, old age, and disease. It's like Mary's doing so many nice things for us all the time. Mm -hmm. Nice service to them in that way. The spiritual master, the superiors like the mother and father. So we're, Krishna is saying the real austerity means to serve the mother, the father, the Brahmins, the guru, serve in that way. And then he says cleanliness, simplicity, celibacy, and nonviolence. So cleanliness. So it's an austerity to be clean. It's very easy. It's it ha we all know it's very easy to let thing become dirty, but it's very difficult to make it to keep a thing clean. That's why we can understand Mother Sundarmani is like the most moto goodness person because she can maintain all this place very nicely all the time, perfectly. Because if you just let when we had COVID, we all got COVID. I mean, it was like a week. The place was trashed. I mean, you saw there was like a, there was like a, there was like a foot of leaves on everything. Remember that, Mother Sundamani? Because the maintenance had stopped. So if you let go of maintenance, it's very easy to ever everything just to get totally fallen apart. So it's an austerity to, to be clean. We should keep our body clean. We should keep our mind clean. And we should keep our environment clean. And in that way, it's much easier to practice spiritual life. Simplicity. What does it mean to be simple? Simple, Prabhupada defines it as is without duplicity simplicity means without duplicity so say it how it is and be truthful be honest be simple in your habits celibacy and nonviolence. so celibacy means that sexual energy is an extremely powerful energy and of course celibacy in, in the sense Prabhupada explained in this purport that celibacy doesn't mean completely uh, free from sex completely it means that either one is living like a monk or is completely free from sex or is in a married relationship using sex for the purpose of having children using that energy in a, in a very directed way because why because that energy is transformed into a higher type of energy when when dovetail with a spiritual practice and that same energy is then used to do amazing things Prabhupada gives the example that gandhi he took a vow of celibacy and when he took that vow of celibacy, he had, he had enough power to, to completely banish the, the British out of England. You know, there was so much fighting going on and, you know, riots. But Gandhi, by his vow of celibacy, he was so powerful that he defeated the English. So one becomes very powerful. And at the, sometimes, like, like I said, I go to the, the gym and there's these guys. They're like, oh, you're a monk? Like, you're celibate? He's like, they're like, man. I want to do that so bad, but I can't. We're like, we're like, but they, they I told them, I said, you know, it's, you know, you have, you, when, when you practice some austerity, not just celibacy, but any austerity, what happens is your words have more potency. People listen to you because that, that's just, it's just, it's a subtle thing. But someone who is practicing austerity, when they speak, their words have more intensity. People always listen. That's why you'll find that. You know, when you have like a sannyasi around, you know, when they say something, it can just hit really hard, even if it's not mean or, you know, uh, you know, if they chest, they can just, they can chastise you with a look. Whereas if it was not, a you know, someone that's practicing austerity, it wouldn't affect you, but because they have so much focus, it has power, it has shakti behind it. And nonviolence. Nonviolence means, first off, not killing animals, not causing direct violence to others, but it also means um, spreading spiritual knowledge is nonviolence. Prabhupada explains that the most violent thing is to have spiritual knowledge and not give it to others because that's violence against the soul or to blatantly 
hinder someone's spiritual progress. That's the ultimate violence you can commit. That's why we get very heavy with certain people who are trying to hinder other people's spiritual progress. That's like, because it's one thing to kill the body, but it's a whole other thing to stop a soul from exiting the material energy. That's much more violent. And so austerities of the mind, satisfaction, this is interesting. So the mind, the mind can wander everywhere, right? The mind is our biggest enemy. The mind is wants this, it wants that, it wants this, it wants that. So the first austerity of the mind is satisfaction, which is very, very rare in this world. But you can tell the mind, I'm satisfied. Otherwise, you'll never be satisfied. I want this. I'm not happy with my service. I'm not happy with this. I'm not happy with that. I'm not happy with this. That's because you're not practicing the austerity of being satisfied. Just tell them I'm satisfied. That's a practice to, to, to tell the mind I'm satisfied. There's a beautiful lecture by Bhaktivedanta Maharaj on the austerities of the mind. You can watch it. Um, he basically says that same thing. We can program our mind to being satisfied. Simplicity, once again, same, same. Gravity, what does it mean to be grave? Prabhupada defines it in different places, but gravity means that we're not always telling everybody our plans. We're not, you know, revealing everything to everybody all the time. We're, we have some gravity. It means that you are developing graveness. It means some, some level of seriousness. In the Krishna book, Prabhupada says specifically that it means that one can't, look at you and understand your plans because gravity means it is deep. My like Prabhupada was very grave. Devotees are very grave, serious, sober about the reality of material life. Speaking of gravity, there's the Dhirodhata Prabhu. He is the grave, grave devotee. Gravity is about So, Anyhow, we we should we should be sober about where about where we're at in the material world, and that's the big misconception that we have. And one who understands properly spiritual knowledge becomes grave; they become serious. Not that they become, you know, they don't have a light heart, like you know, they don't joke, they don't, they're not happy. But it means that they're they're aware of the nature of the reality. They're aware that this place is not a place for an eternal living entity. It's a temporal place. Krishna himself says, says this is a temporary world full of suffering. Dukalaya Mashashvatam. Temporary and full of miseries. So if you understand that, and that my real business is not to try to enjoy the prison, my real business is to get out of the prison. And we don't come to a prison to enjoy. You know, they don't put you in a prison to have fun. So this is a prison world. Everything's entangling us. There's always this little bit of happiness, so much misery, some happiness, misery, all karmic. So someone who understands that, they realize, no, no, okay, now I'm, I'm working to get out and I'm experiencing a higher type of happiness. Um, purification of one's existence are the austerities of the mind. So if one can perform those austerities of speech, body, and mind, then one can become very happy in the world. One can become very, very vibrant in their spirituality. But it starts with speech, vacho vegam, that we speak words which are truthful, pleasing, and beneficial. So speak truth means to speak words relating to Krishna or words relating to God consciousness. And not to lie, obviously, not to outright blatantly lie. To be truthful with ourselves. So we always want to be truthful because it's actually, if you tell a lie, there's always a karmic reaction. You can't be peaceful, my Shashika Prabhu says. You can never be peaceful if you lie. You'll never be peaceful. Even a little lie. And the mind is a liar. It wants to lie. It does. It just wants to lie. Even a little bit, exaggerate. But if you can curb that, that propensity to want to exaggerate, to want to lie, even white lie, to do all that. If you can curb that propensity, then the mind becomes very peaceful. 
because the mind, if it tells a lie, there's a karmic reaction. It gets agitated. Can't be peaceful. So the more honest we are, no matter in what circumstances, be honest. I love Dr. Darnell, actually. He's always extremely honest. I always find that Darnell's always very honest and very straightforward. I really appreciate that quality in Dr. Darnell. So if we have that, and grave. So if we have that, uh, that quality of being very honest with our words, then it's, it's amazing because we, we want to live in the lie a lot of the time. We want to live a lie. And we like our words support that lie. Because we think that this, this lie world, this made up illusion world is better than the reality. But if you speak the truth and you live the truth, then what happens is you find that the truth is so much more amazing, mystical, beautiful, and glorious than any type of world you make up. And I always feel like Vaisheshika Prabhu, uh, he just demonstrates that so nicely. He just, it just shows when you see someone really living the truth of devotional service and you see that all these mystical things happen to them on a regular basis. They're, it's amazing. You know, like Indrajuna Maharaj, where he's so inspiring because he's living that truth, living, this, living these teachings. Speaking words that are truthful, pleasing. So we want to be truthful, but we also want to be pleasing. It's one thing to tell the truth, but if you tell the truth in such a way that it displeases others, and that is also not good. There's a verse in the 11th canto. Krishna says that, you know, to, to be very truthful, but to agitate everybody is not pleasing. It's not pleasing to me or the saintly persons. So we want to be truthful, but at the same time, pleasing. That can be difficult sometimes, right? Because people, the classic saying is the truth hurts. So you have to learn how to do it and be in a proper way, which that's an austerity to figure out. It's easy to just go, blah, 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 I'm speaking the truth. But to think, wait a minute, how am I going to say this in such a way that, this per that, it's, that it's pleasing, beneficial, and truthful? How am I going to do that? That's an austerity. That means I have to take some time. Non-agitating. It's different when it's a teacher and a student. The, the teacher has the ability to agitate and correct the student in even a heavy way. But just in general, general people. Non-agitating. And also regularly reciting Vedic literatures. So we don't want to speak words that are based in illusion, right? In that same text I originally quoted, that it says there's these things that destroy our spirituality. Adyahara prayasyascha prajalpa niyamagraha. Overeating, over endeavoring. Prajalpa means to speak uselessly. Useless mundane talks that have no value. It's one thing to speak about, you know, we can talk about so many things if they're, if they're of value in the moment. But people are so absorbed in uselessness, that's not going to help them in the end. Like they're speaking of, you know, their favorite movie stars and all, you know, all this gossip and drama. This is useless speech. Simply to distract myself from the real pain of the material world, trying to distract myself. When you just face it and you start realizing it and applying knowledge, then that pain goes away. And my words are speaking about Krishna, Lord Chaitanya, when he was a scholar, and Nimai Pandit. And then Chaitanya Bhagavad, he says one statement, he says, any, any words that aren't actually describing God are a lie, right? So even, even if we're speaking like about, you know, you could say like, oh, Mother Sanam, I go to get the van fixed. And I'm not talking about Krishna directly, but it's in relation to service. So everything should be in relation to our service. We should connect everything to God. And those words are truthful, beneficial, pleasing. And by reciting the Vedic literatures, what we're doing now, speaking on the Vedic literatures, that's very, very uplifting. And if you, if you just read verses, just read Bhagavad Gita verses, memorize Bhagavad Gita verses, you, it's amazing what happens. It gives you so much shakti to, to memorize verses. It's an underestimated thing. Even if you don't use them in preaching or speaking, but just memorizing verses is very powerful. So the point is, is that the power of speech is very, very important and learning how to speak to people in a way that's sweet. And I'll just end with this last story from my sojourn to the Banner Health Medical Facility yesterday, two days ago. 
where I had some issues in my heart and I was at that place. And then there was a lot of insane people in that hospital room. It was crazy in the, in the waiting room. And like, there was this guy, his name was Billy the Kid. And he was like, he stunk really bad. And he was like totally crazed. And he sat by us. My, my mom was like freaked out. And he sat by us. And like, you know, the devotees, we just treat him nice. You know, and he was like, you know, you know, he was very agitating, defensive. We treated him nice. And he saw that I was like, you know, chanting. And he came over and brought me some beads mm -hmm. that he had, like, he, like, really out of kindness. You saw it was like, just because he wanted to give something. And I, I took those beads. They were like, there was like a nice bead necklace. And I offered it to Giri Raj so that he got the benefit. So just that day, I, I found like, dealing with a lot of different people because you, you treat people nicely, you treat them sweetly. It's only in your favor because they just treat you better. You don't, you know, if you learn how to deal with people in a very wonderful way, you're not missing out because you're going to get so much more. And there's a nice lecture you can hear by Bhakti Dira Damodar Maharaj about tolerance. You know, how if you, if you tolerate, it's like a, it's like a superpower. Because when you tolerate something and you learn how to speak to people very sweetly rather than getting angry, and then, you know, Krishna opens doors for you. So any questions or comments? Mary. Oh, I do. But I was going to me. You know, you said uh, laughing in the battlefield caught my ear. And... Um, you said, uh, you know, well, we're in the middle of a battle, so we don't want to be too frivolous or silly when we're in the middle of a battle. And I have just a little bit of a different take on it. I think it flips the enemy out so much when we show no fear and we can just laugh in the face of so much problem. And um, people uh, ask me, I drive Uber, and people say, do you drive at night? And I go, yeah. And they say, aren't you scared? said, you can't scare me. I teach in American high schools. You can't scare me. There's nothing hardly anybody can do anymore that's going to kick kick the, the, the floor out from under me. But yeah, there's still things that will. But, you know, I, can, I, I find pleasure in not showing, not, not just not showing fear, but not being afraid in certain it's not situations. Fear. Yeah. It's a matter of seriousness. Yeah, oh, yeah. But just one thing not be afraid of working on the power lines, another thing to be frivolous while working on the power lines. Oh, yeah. Not, so not if too. you don't know what you're doing and you think that everything's okay, then the material right. energy will win. It doesn't matter. You know, we have some karma to enjoy right now. We're enjoying, oh, yes, I'm enjoying very nicely. Everything is very good. Yeah. But I wasted my life in spirituality. I didn't advance yeah. spiritually. So what happens is all the sinful things that I've done, which we've all done, all the negative karma things they also have to come back so in this life i may have some karma that i can have a happy time i can be willy-dilly that's great we're americans we have a very nice life we live in but in your next life you can take birth in a very horrible place and so from the perspective of reality we have to be serious yeah, inside your heart knows what it's doing and it's going to persist but we should always be positive. joy is still there we should always be joyful devotee means joyful you have to be joyful. But that does not mean that we're frivolous with our speech, right. with our words. Otherwise, we're just enjoying materially and that we're not making any spiritual advancement. It's just material enjoyment. Material enjoyment has a beginning, it has an end. And if we delight too much in it, we become attached to it. Then what happens is, you know, we have to we have to still suffer reactions. It doesn't actually do us any value in the end. Chandrika. <laughs> You were saying at the beginning of the class about how devotees are very rare yeah. um, and also, you know, coming to the temple for worship and and all that is there and it's important and we need to do it. But there's also a, a connection that we have, you know, with Guru, with Krishna that just comes to us personally so that it inspires us to want to come to the temple and, and that worship and do devotional service. I don't know if you can elaborate on that. A misunderstanding slightly. Um, I said devotees are very rare, but then they're rare, and and you know, coming to the temple for worship, but also we have that connection directly with Krishna that 
personally yeah, connects that, with I'm them. just trying to figure out how does that relate to the, did I say something about the temple? Well, just, yeah, you mentioned about coming to the temple for worship and like that. You said oh, that I'm, saying, I'm saying about like, I'm saying that the basic devotee, the, the Kanishta Adhikari just comes to the temple. He doesn't actually. Right. Yeah. Well, that's the idea is that, that, you know, that some, like someone who's a really basic person, they're just coming to the temple. They don't, you know, they're not thinking about spiritual advancement. It's more or less like just a ritual. You know, like we see that, you know, I just go to church on Sunday. I don't really know anything. I, you know, it's just like more of a tradition or ritual type thing rather than, I mean, just because you come to the temple doesn't mean you're not. Right. And Mahabhagana Prabhupada also went to temples, you know, established, he's a Mahabhagava. That doesn't have any bearing on, on our advancement and our connection to Krishna is beyond just the temple. Ultimately, right. it's it's in our heart. Right. That's what I was saying about the personal relationship that we have with Krishna. But if someone, the point I'm making is that if someone is is not advanced, they don't experience that. They're just mm -hmm. more or less coming to the temple. It's a very external thing. Right. And so one has to develop an internal, you know, temple in the, as the super soul and that connection with, like you said, Guru and Krishna. So, yeah, yeah, that's, that's correct. So we're out of time. Go to Rajan Bhagavatam. Then we'll take some breakfast.